Good evening, good afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome to... I think it's Wednesday, right? It seems like Wednesday. If it's not Wednesday, my apologies. I um, hope everyone's doing well on this wonderful Wednesday afternoon. Uh, so it is History of Detroit. We're going to go from 1940 to 1950 tonight. Um, and I was wondering how I wanted to break this up, but I think I'm going to do it this way since we're here. Um, and we'll do the entirety of that time frame tonight, and then go back to some specific things at a later date. So that's kind of how we're going to break down, break it down, and and go for it. Um, so let's say hello and we'll get right into it. What's up, Dazzer? Linda, hello, hello. Talk, Mama, hello. Uh, that's good. That's good that you only have to do PT. No surgery, no uh, knees suck. Hello, Mystic. I got it. Digger, hello, hello. Uh, HT, hello. What's up, Dees? What's up, Fire? So, uh, like I said, 1940s. So, what's going on in the world during the 1940s? Obviously, World War II. So you'll see a lot that's centered around World War II and some of the tension surrounding World War II. Um, And then, like I said, we'll get into some more specifics after that whole World War II area. Because there's a lot here, but there's not a lot here. There was a lot of focus, um, a lot of focus with a, a lot of different things regarding the war, but there wasn't a whole hell of a lot that was going on outside of that. Um, a couple a couple notable things, but it, it really hasn't been like the previous decades where we had uh, buildings going up and blah, 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 and back and forth, all that kind of good stuff. So, but, so next week will be war-specific. 
we'll go into a little bit more depth about what everyone was doing more time wise and that good stuff. Um, and then we'll go on to the 50s, which was a cool time. So I thought we'd start out with the uh, courtesy of the Detroit Historical Society. This is just random color footage um, from the 1940s. So I figured we'd just see what it looked like back then. The hair, the quality of life, you know. And there is no volume to it. So that's the Detroit River. Again, this is just random footage around the area in, in 1940. So there's no rhyme or reason to any of it. That's the Belle Isle Bridge. So that's the bridge that takes you out to Belle Isle. You see people swimming, fishing. The water looks real clean. That's the Belle Isle Fountain. Still there. That's probably Belle Isle and the Detroit River. That's definitely Belle Isle. That statue's still there. So there used to be a lot more recreation. Um, we were just down there over the weekend. It looks slightly different. And by slightly, I mean significantly. <laughs> so uh, you still see the freighters and they're pumping out smoke because they're burning coal. It's that kind of time. National Steer Corporation. We'll get into them a little bit later. I don't know what that is. They did not have cell phone video back then. <laughs> so we still have the bubbly looking cars, the, you know, Some tennis courts. This is the Detroit Zoo. Uh, no idea what the hell that is. It's probably the Detroit skyline. Oh, that's the yacht club. So that's the yacht club. Or the boat club. One of the two. Yeah, Paquin Bell Island looked like an isle. Uh, isle look like an island, not concrete. Yeah. You can see the difference. You can see the boating. You can see, I mean, people swimming all over, that kind of stuff. That, that just doesn't take place anymore. Typical 1940s people. Hudson Plant. There's the Ambassador Bridge. Looks like the Henry Ford Museum Center. Yes. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's got to be Greenfield Village, Henry Ford. That's the Detroit Zoo, so it might have been the zoo. Choo choo, where's Bobby? <laughs> I heard Ted Nugent say Detroit wasn't the murder capital because they are more violent, but because they're better shot. Yep. <laughs> I 
That's probably City Airport. Uh, I can't read it. I don't know what that was. That looks up up in Berkeley, doesn't it? When I say doesn't it, I'm strictly speaking to UAP. <laughs> Ford Motor Company. So there's a factory. It's probably the DIA by the look of it. Penscott Building. Yeah. Okay. That's definitely the DIA. There's the temple, the Masonic temple. There were like parks where you could not get robbed in. God, it was so nice back then. That is not at all what Detroit looks like today. <laughs> Your brother's a Freemason, Lynn? Look at that pretty boat. That looks like the Ford Mansion. Up on the north side. <laughs> yes, they're very smart. It just seemed like a diff I mean different time. I mean I wouldn't even be conceived for another till the end of this window for another thirty eight years. So that's a word word. So that is, oh, no, stop it. So that's just an idea of the area during the time frame. That's kind of what it looked like. It's kind of what to, to expect. Uh, very quiet, very, uh, I don't know. It was just a different time. So obviously it was very long ago. And, uh, Everything just looked kind of clean and neat and tidy. It was pretty. It's really pretty. So, let's get into it. I know. I know, Tees. Uh, no. No, they're not. <laughs> no. Um, for, for a big city, Detroit is relatively clean. And until you get into, like, 
super ghetto areas down by like Zug Island, that kind of shit. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it's 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 a lot better than many of the cities I've been to. But not not that clean and and pristine, no. So my dad's neighborhood went far downhill late seventies through nineties. Wouldn't be want to be found dead there now. Yeah. Yep. And that's that's when you saw a lot of the kind of breakdown. Mom and dad went to Cody High. So there's a cracker and you might not survive. <laughs> there's a lot of those places now. Um so it's it's unfortunate because it is. It's a beautiful city. Uh so nineteen forty. I just this has no significance to anything, but the US Navy was testing out these torpedo boats. Uh so they were new types of boats. Um this one was just a giant ball. I could not find it because uh torpedo boat is such a wide just such a wide range of things. So there wasn't a specific footage of this, but I would I would have loved to. Uh but anyways, the strange watercraft and experimental torpedo boat performs a test run in the Detroit River near Detroit on December twenty eighth, nineteen forty. The large wheel is powered by a 360 horsepower motor. So it's just a big ball with fins on it. Um, T.F. Thompson of Des Moines, Iowa and A.W. Reed of Windsor, Ontario designed the craft, which they hope would reach a top speed of 300 miles per hour. I don't think they ever got there. I'm glad because it probably would have resulted in dozens, if not more deaths. Oh, <laughs> it it doesn't look like a a very sound physics concept, uh, but I'm always for trying new things, and it's it's a neat idea. I wish I could have found something more on it, but just an interesting side note. So, uh, 1940s. Well, there was an Armistice Day storm that killed 67 people and destroyed five vessels on Lake Michigan. So the 1940 Armistice Day storm was, for all intents and purposes, it was nasty. I mean, that uh, you can see those are tops of cars. Uh, tops of cars <laughs> that were buried in the snow. A lot of snow really quickly, and that makes for. It makes for problems. It was uh, November 11th, 1940. And it's widely considered the worst in the history of Lake Michigan, um, of the area. So it was, and 67 people in a snowstorm. Again, you're, you're thinking of a time where we don't have advanced warnings or don't have all the other things. But... Uh, yeah, it's it was uh it was pretty nasty and there's a lot of a lot of things that happened uh as a result of it because of it and it wouldn't have been a fun time cuz Michigan can get really cold. So here's a short Armistice Day storm was one of the bigger storms. Of course, there was the great storm of 1913. There was the storm Maybe. of 1905. I would think so. There was so. the storm in 1975 that took down the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, this was not the worst storm, but it was the storm that we were caught off guard. There was no time to prepare for this. And that's why not only sailors died, but many, many people on land died from just the frigid temperatures. I think what people don't realize is that the temperature change came on so quickly. Uh, it was 65 and 70 degrees during the day, and at 1 o'clock, in the space of just a few minutes, it went to below zero. It's hard to comprehend. And considering the weather we've been experiencing this month in November, um, we start to get a feel for what this might have been like 75 years ago. So they're they're obviously showing some of the ships that were 
revolved. Uh, Nova Doc. And they're all In the case of so many accidents, if we can find good that comes out of bad, then we realize that the people who died didn't die in vain. And in this case, the 64 sailors who died on Lake Michigan and the people who died on shore, um, their loss prompted major changes with the National Weather Bureau that led to our being able to predict more efficiently the changing weather conditions. So those people's lives may have saved many, many more people in the years to come. So yeah, it was it was a pretty intense storm, and any storm where people lose their lives is obviously pretty intense. So um, also in 1940, we got our first lady that uh, serves as Lieutenant Governor of Michigan, paving the way for the current Gretchen Whitmer. So I kind of have mixed feelings about it. Great Lakes are no joke when Mother Nature decides to teach humans how insignificant they are. Yeah, and we'll get into that with, obviously, we'll do Fitzgerald and, and some of the other shipwrecks and that kind of stuff. But, yeah, it, the lakes are are like small oceans. They're very large. They're much larger than I think people notice or give them credit for that aren't from the area. And they can spin up weather really quickly. So. Uh, 1940, Matilda, Matilda Dodge Wilson was the first woman to serve as Michigan's lieutenant governor, the position she held from January 1st, 1940 to January 1st, 1941. So she was the lieutenant governor of the great state of Michigan for a grand total of one year. And then we get back into... We, we heard a little bit about this at the end of last week's episode. Uh, coming out of the Great Depression, uh, factories going back to work, unions coming in very strong, um, and the battle of battle of the overpass between Ford and, and people that are trying to unionize. Well, Ford Mon- Motor Company remained the last major auto company to refuse to recognize the UAW or any union as the bargaining agent for its workers. And just at the time, we were starting to move into this, uh, we were starting to move into this worker protection and and workers really getting kind of uh, better treatment, better pay, that kind of stuff, which they probably deserved. Um, It was getting kind of touchy. But this is still Henry Ford, who paid his workers really well, uh, probably didn't... uh, didn't uh didn't do enough for the safety aspect but he he was paying a good decent wage and he seemed to to take care of his workers and definitely did not want the union moving in so the UAW had already signed contracts with General Motors and Chrysler but Henry Ford remained opposed to unionization so of course what happens when People attempt to use, un, unionize, uh, you get another riot. And we're going to see more and more, and that's going to become more and more um, of a thing as we, as we kind of come up through the time. So uh, this was really to, just to get Henry Ford to cave so, and allow unionization of the Ford Motor Company. Uh, so 1941 as well, the Davidson Freeway was built, the first urban one ever built in the United States of America. So again, here's Detroit leading the charge. We're going to take a drive down Davidson Freeway. It is not a long freeway. It connects probably my favorite road, the Lodge. I've never been in traffic in the Lodge. That's why it's my favorite. So John C. Lodge or uh, Highway 10 or whatever whatever you'd like to call it. But most people call it the Lodge around here. So um, it's not far, and you'll see. So here's, here's where it starts, 10. And it was just a connector between the major 
interstates and and highway or freeways and stuff like that highways excuse me um in the area to connect a much needed area so you didn't have to go down come back up and go back around so uh this is the m8 or the davidson freeway in detroit oh thanks for the map dude uh this is not mine but so it starts up here and it kind of connects over so it runs all the way down i believe that this was the original start of it i don't actually remember what was the, the original start of it but it kind of connected things so you didn't have to go all the way around there obviously wasn't as many roads at that time they kind of filled in afterwards so this was instrumental in keeping keeping a lot of things <laughs> Because that's probably copyright music. I don't know how loud it is. So this is, uh, you have northbound 75 to Flint, southbound 75 to Toledo. And it kind of takes you, you can see 94, um, kind of takes you into the city. Yeah, the lodge, I swear there's no speed limit still. Um, so... As you can see, it splits 75 and 94. 94 is east-west. 75 is north-south. By 75 is the main north-south interstate. And it connects them several times, so you run into, you run into a couple different things. Because um, things kind of get wonky around around the area they kind of go back and forth but so this is what it looks like today still not terrible but this is a nicer part And there's the lodge. It's only 5.5 miles long and was originally built by Wayne County. Huh. It gets pretty up here every once in a while, but. Livernoy. The western end, we've followed the ramp northbound side of the lodge. Your air is usually gray. That's never good. Seven mile, so we're going south into the city. Lodge between downtown and Telegraph Road, station eight US ten, blah blah blah. There's eight mile. Oh, wait, are we going? Are we going north or southbound on east or west? I don't fucking know. Anyways, we're going some direction. Can't see the, can't see the thing. Yeah, how's the rain going for you? Are you guys? Uh, I hope you're doing okay out there, Linda, and not. Becoming a fish.
I was watching the Storm Tracers the other day. I thought we were going north, but then it said it was going into Detroit. And I'm like, all right, we're going south. But no, that's Telegraph, so we're going north. Six ninety six to Lansing. Yeah, we're definitely going north. So that's kind of a drive from the first freeway. So first urban freeway built in the United States. So then we get into more tension. And tension is going to be the, I, I don't know if it was directly coming out of the war that was the issue or or what the problem was, but there was a lot of tension, a lot of tension between the unions, a lot of tension between, as we'll see coming up. And this was another big tension spot. So the Sojourner Truth housing project. So Sojourner Truth, uh, it was obviously for African Americans, um, that kind of thing, and it was it was a housing project, and they were really nice houses, and <laughs> you know the rest of them wanted in uh, the non African Americans. So there's a couple pictures. This one, so we'll go through. Uh, so they're bringing all kinds of armed guards, military, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so this is kind of the housing project. So this was the, the picketers for the housing projects. Um, and then, of course, it gets into a riot and there's people throwing rocks at cops and so on and so forth. And so there's just a couple pictures of the area at the time. And then we'll watch a little bit about... <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so now we'll go into a little bit about the, the housing project. Um, As America prepared to enter World War II, the Motor City transformed itself into the arsenal of democracy. With masses of workers flocking to Detroit's industries, a severe housing shortage particularly affected African Americans. In 1941, a new housing project was proposed specifically for black occupancy and was named Sojourner Truth in honor of the black abolitionist and women's rights activist. Amid unrelenting pressure from nearby white neighbors, the city's housing office redesignated the buildings for whites. This in turn unleashed a barrage of complaints from blacks and their allies, including unions. The housing office again reversed its decision. On the morning of February 28th, white protesters gathered to intimidate the first black residents as they began moving in. Soon violence erupted. Of the 220 people arrested, 217 were black. By April, state Damn. troops arrived to protect the new tenants and quell any further disturbance. However, the dispute over the Sojourner Truth project was but a precursor of the racial conflicts that lay ahead. So that's exactly right. So, uh, guarded by more than 1,500 state troops, city and state police, moving vans carried the household goods of black families into Sonar Journey's Truth, a federal housing project located in a white section of Detroit on April 29, 1942. And, and we've seen in previous episodes where we had the wall. Uh, that was built to to physically separate and segregate. We've had all kinds of laws and different stuff like that to to keep blacks out of uh, white areas. Um, and things really just started boiling up. It's really started getting to getting to a point. You you are you are fifty years late. Um, <laughs> so it really started getting to a point where it was really truly getting out of hand because you were getting kind of uh all this tension and you were getting you were getting some 
pretty shady things going on where they weren't being fair to black residents. They weren't um, treating them properly and then uh, playing favorites. So that that's true. That's true. Um, so it, it it was bad from both sides because you had what you had basically the makings of the traditional Democrats. You had the um, segregation, the black housing projects, the separation, the the isolation of the black population. On the other side of that, you had well, in support of them, you had unions and uh, workers' rights and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then in opposition to that, you had uh, people that just wanted a fair shake at things and equality and all that stuff. Um, you also had, of course, th that same Democrat Party that later created the the KKK to, you know, do, do some shady shit. <laughs> but uh yeah so so it went back and forth and and there was quite a quite a bit of tension um but it was a terrible idea for the for the federal government to to come in and nope we're gonna segregate we're gonna we're gonna break this apart we're going to instill our our ideology and our thought process on people that frankly were doing kind of just fine and if We'll see later when we get into things like Model Cities program and things like that. If if the federal government and namely the Democrats would have just stayed the hell out of Detroit, it would be it would be a great place, a much better place. Um so that's that's kind of my opinion on it. But so then we go into the nineteen forty three race riots. So about a year after, not not even eight, nine months, government never helps ever. No, no, it just made it worse. So police attempt to break up an incident as race rioting flared in the downtown area of Detroit on June 21st, 1943. Troops were called in at the request of Michigan Governor Harry F. Kelly when police were unable to stop the fighting. So... This was the 1943 Beaumont race riots, and and again it was interjection, tension, and not helping the situation, making the situation worse and worse, and and it led to another another giant race riot. So during World War II, Beaumont had become an industrial war town. Its factories and shipyards were heavily engaged in providing for the U.S. military in its battle against Hitler and Japan. The war effort drew almost 20,000 new residents to work in shipping and manufacturing industries. But the economic boost came with a price. Housing shortages were severe and it forced races to live in close proximity. In the factories, blacks began to have access to skilled jobs, a situation that put them in competition with white workers. Tensions between whites and blacks were serious enough that in early June, separate commuter transportation had been put into service to end racial violence on overcrowded buses. The sudden increase in population also caused food shortages and food allotments. Ration cards were issued in Beaumont due to the lack of canned goods and meats available. On June 15th, a black man was accused of assaulting an 18-year-old Beaumont girl, the daughter of a shipyard worker. This rumor caused racial tensions in the city to explode. On the evening of June 15th, more than 2,000 workers from the shipyard, along with thousands of bystanders, marched towards City Hall and the police station to find the man accused. The mob yeah, and people that. were unable to locate him, thus causing the mob of now over 4,000 people to turn into the streets. Interesting question. Armed with guns, axes, and hammers, they proceeded to search <laughs> and terrorize the black neighborhoods in downtown Beaumont, breaking into businesses, pillaging, wrecking, and burning property while attacking black residences. More than 100 homes and businesses were destroyed that night. This violence caught the attention of the state and the nation. The mayor mobilized the Texas State Guard that night, along with the force of 1,800 guardsmen, 100 state police, and 75 Texas Rangers. Oh, the shit, Texas that's... governor declared Beaumont to be under martial Oops.
Hang on. Never mind. Uh, I pulled up the wrong one again. It. So the problem I found is when I pull them all up, they run. They keep running. And it goes to another 1943 race riot. Let me pull up the, like it auto plays. I should turn that off. That would probably help. I guess it's probably fine, right? Because I think it started with it and then went elsewhere with it. Okay, I'm stupid. That was the right one. And I just... No? Hang on. No, that was the wrong one. I apologize. I am... I'm trying to figure it out. Give me a second. Because it like auto plays, and I bring them all up and don't ever change them over. Here we go. This was the actual video. Sorry, I need to. There we go. That's better. Same story, just different. Yeah, is it not sure? There should be audio. Let me try it again. Hang on. Let's see if there's audio this time. Is there audio now? In 1943, Detroit's economy was booming due to the growth in the defense industry. Since the beginning of World War II, the city's population grew by 350,000, 300,000 whites and 50,000 okay. blacks. Due to a number of reasons, including a lack of available housing, tensions between blacks and whites were escalating. On June 20th, 1943, a fight between a group of black youth and white sailors on Belle Isle kicked off a citywide reaction. False stories stoked the conflict into a riot. By the next day, 10,000 whites poured onto Woodward near Forrest and Werner to attack blacks in the streets and overturn cars. Blacks retaliated by attacking whites who ventured into their neighborhoods. As night closed in, 5,000 federal troops were called in to restore the peace. There was more than $2 million in property damaged. The greater loss resulted in the death of 25 blacks 
and nine whites and more than I agree, 600 light, right? injured. There comes a time in the life of every community when it must look honestly and seriously into its past in order to provide the best possible foundation for moving into a future based on healing and hope. In the race, the All right, we don't need their advertising. Um, so, yeah, so yet another race riot. Apologize for the video. Um, I think I have the rest that are fixed now that are stopped so they're not continuously running into 17 million new things um but anyways i put this specific image because there's a there's a slide that of course was put out after um the public affairs committee so uh it's relatively small but i'll i'll read it blow it up and read it uh how to lessen racial tension better housing learning democratic behavior in school church and your civic group firmness and understanding by employers disciplinary action by unions federally sponsored citizen committees cooperation by press and the radio thorough investigation and prompt action in all Quote, incidents, just reading the paper, efficient policing of Negro districts and immediate availability of federal troops. So there's a lot of compare and contrast to what's going on today in the United States and and around the world. And I don't know, man, they were they were bringing in federal troops all the damn time during during the 40s. 30s and 40s um and that's not something we see they're a lot more covert about it i i don't i don't doubt they're still doing some shady kins but uh yeah it was just a different world where they they did not even hesitate to bring in federal troops and roll them into cities which would be terrifying and it would be terrifying if it happened today for sure um i don't think anybody would be Super excited about that. But that was kind of the that was kind of the way behind it. They would uh bring in all these federal troops and just roll them into cities and towns. So um especially the bigger cities. So but in nineteen forty five I put this one in just because it's it's incredible to look back. Motorists line the street waiting to buy gasoline at 17 cents per gallon at a station in Detroit on September 24, 1945. Such sh- stations were not affected by the strike of Yank Waycon truck drivers and did big business as nearly all other stations supplied by truck were closed. So a lot of the gas stations were closed. This was a little bit higher for gas, but 17 cents a gallon in 1945. Gee, I would love 17 cents a gallon gas. I would drive for days just for the hell of it. But we'll never see anything close. Um, but yeah, this was this was another external strike. Um, I don't know who Emily Willis is, but I imagine... I don't want to either, Deed. Uh So this was a case of somewhere it will stay open despite the unionization and strike of many. 1946, Kelly Services, Inc. Uh, formerly the Kelly Ru- Russell Kelly Office Service and Kelly Girl Service, Inc. is an American office staffing company that now operates globally. So... Kelly, I I've seen it around. Um, I was unaware that it was established here in Detroit. Um, and I'm sure everybody's heard of it, but Keeley Kelly, whatever the hell it is. Uh, so it's basically office staffing. They're a huge global brand now, and it started here in the Motor City. So yet another cus- and 
another company that everybody knows about or everybody's heard of. I thought this was neat. Um, back when I was a kid, my my grandparents used to take us to um, they do all these tall ships and boat races and stuff like that. Uh, they race around the Great Lakes with the tall ships from um, like Bay City area. I think it might even go further than that down now, but uh, that's where we used to go is when it was in like the Bay City area. And then all the way to the other side of the state, all the way through the Great Lakes and these these old wooden ships. Um, one of those JT Wing uh, on its last trip was July 24th, 1948. Uh, from the dock near the foot of 24th Street to Belle Isle, where it's moored as a museum ship. I did not, I don't know where that's at. I went down to Dosen, which is the the Great Lakes Museum in Detroit um, this weekend to see if I could see it. And I did not see it directly. So I don't know exactly where it's at. Um I could see the Ambassador Bridge in the back of the footage that we're going to watch. So it might be on the other side. Um, I might go back down this weekend and see if I can't see it again. But uh, AP, if you know where it's at, let me know. Or if it's still down there. They say it's still down there. But So this is, uh, this is its last voyage where it was docked on Bella. There is no audio on this one, so. I remember filling my tank for five buckets. I had a 13-gallon tank. Or five bucks, sorry. Damn. That's crazy. I think that would be really cool to do. Like, I would hardcore go out on a boat like that. Oh, look at that. Oh, no, stop. I want to look at that. Look at that. There's a train in the background. Where's Bobby? I didn't I didn't see it but um so there's a pier marquette there's several um they came from Ohio they were made in Ohio uh Lima Ohio and there were a lot of steam trains that came out of that area so I had to look there it is <laughs> Look at all those boats out there. Like, that is not what it looks like today. It's not what any of that looks like today. Large craft and small salute her. There's a freighter. There's Coast Guard. I'm sure some things got better, some things got worse, but we lost the... That kind of classy look of stuff. Like, that boat looks really cool. That's the Ambassador Bridge in the background. Bridge of Canada. Firefighting boat, probably. Spraying water. Like, the Detroit River is nothing like that anymore. It's crazy.
Every person there was drunk, too. Guaranteed. Look at that. That's cool. What I assume is a firefighter boat. To the people of the city of Detroit. Yeah, I know. People used to dress up for stuff. Like, everybody there is, you know, tie and suit and tie and a hat of some kind. Off topic, find a research the Puget Sound ferry competitions. The steam ferries would explode with cheering passengers betting on the outcome. Huh. Will do. That sounds neat. I wish I knew what any of these people were saying. But I don't. You guys got a cool hat. So since we don't have audio, we'll cut it right there. But uh, yeah, just another really cool thing. Uh, often overlooked the wing. A boat. Now we have things like the Detroit Princess, but it's just, it's not the same. Not the same. So we move on to steel. So we talked about previously there was pig iron. That was the big thing of the day. Um, but then we get into steel production. So they start producing actual steel here. Not just in Pennsylvania, but like I said, we had a ton of ore coming in from the UP. Um, the ore would come down, uh, and at start, they would ship it all out, and it would go to Pittsburgh, um, also known as Steel City. They're saying, so uh, someday people will watch this and talk about how cool this was. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we get we get companies like McLaughlin Steel that begins a hundred million dollar expansion uh, in Trenton, um, and and there's just a list of steel companies, and uh, they finally they started producing it here, and and you got a lot of it like that. So because I know everybody likes the older videos, and I do as well. We're going to watch one about steel production because it's fucking neat. It's really cool. Mounds of a pregnant ore tower thrusting up their bulk with pride they bear beneath their slopes the substance of the power to be released through man's all-knowing care. In awesome mass, sharp etched against fiery cloud. The cauldrons of terrible heat and searing blast summon a titan who sleeps within a shroud of impure earth, of dross until it's cast. He will not serve unless he be given form, but grant to him the endless aching toil of eager, questing, strong and visioned men. Give him their ardent hopes their courage bold, 
their brains, their sweat, their strength. Now let the potion boil neath bright and purifying flame. Then, with a power awful to behold, let him be formed, and steel shall be his name. If we do, it's very, very little. Um, if we don't, we don't produce it like we used to. I know that for sure. Um, but if we do, it is very little. Uh, this this uh, Trenton plant is still. I know it still exists. Um, I know it's not making the steel that it, that it once did, but I know it still exists. So. Today's steel mill is the mightiest and most important machine ever to be turned by human hands. And the story of the iron oh, it's been horrible. is more fabulous than any legend, more epic than any story out of Homer. This is the Vulcan Forge. The Promethean Furnace, visioned in man-made myth, made real by myth-dwarfing vision. Here are the deep, long, endless, flame-drenched caverns where metal boils and rumbles. Here is the fiery pit. Here is the inferno. This is the masterwork. This is the immense, the overpowering spectacle of a steel mill. And the plot of its story is how man became a giant. For the genius of a steel mill is the genius of the people. Each man is the custodian of the heritage of the steel maker. From the earliest days of the industry, the mills and the furnaces have been built by the rivers and water courses. But the greatest of all industrial waterways carrying more commerce than the Suez and the Panama together is the curving ribbon which flows past the city of Detroit. Now the like of this city is known nowhere in the world. Birthplace of the motor car and home of the automotive industry, this vast industrial complex is the largest consumer of finished steel on the whole map of our world. Of the huge commerce, which reaching down the Great Lakes passes through the Detroit River, the greatest tonnage by far is in the rich cargo of the long ore boats. Near the upper reaches of the Great Lakes, south and west of the Superior, we discovered one of the world's greatest iron deposits. In almost inexhaustible supply, the ranges have yielded thousands of millions of tons of rich iron ore to the great shovels which cut grand canyons into the woodlands. From the deep open pit mines by rail car along the trestles to the docks of Duluth and Superior, where the great ore boats are ready, down come the chutes and iron ore rushes into the boat holes. From the Northland, down the Great Lakes, the ore boats steam toward the steel plants. For many years, they were a familiar sight as they moved past the automotive city. But they were only of passing interest. The river was merely a stage in the journey. But to some, it seemed illogical that all the ore boats should sail right on past the city. Why shouldn't steel be made and processed right in the area where such a vast amount of steel is consumed? It was for a steel man to sense the contradiction, to see the obvious solution, to make a dream a reality. 
the only suitable location had every advantage, except solid ground. The site selected was a swampland, a bog on the banks of the river. To work went the fillers and haulers. Four million cubic yards of earth were needed to fill in the area. To work went the pile drivers. One hundred thousand piles were driven to bedrock. And so the miracle was made. Two hundred and seventy-five acres of waste marsh were converted into a usable industrial plant site with firm foundations for the mighty mill machinery. And in due time, through single-minded purpose and force of will, one of the largest and most modern of integrated steel plants was erected on the banks of the Detroit River. All was ready. Then on a memorable day, in a glaring light, hot metal was poured and the strength of an ideal had held secure. Fifteen months after the starting of construction, the first heat of steel was tapped from an open hearth furnace. The great steel mill stands today, giving employment to many thousands, giving a vast industry the advantage of nearby supply, providing the area with a rich new enterprise. The furnaces blaze without interruption. The hot steel rolls on and on. The men and mills stand solidly together. In coils and sheets, in numerous useful forms, like an endless avalanche, finished steel pours out of the shipping gates on huge trucks and trailers in countless rail cars. The mill delivers the goods to a huge steel-hungry industry. Another dawn breaks over the river upon a scene of dramatic significance. Now the Great Lakes steel plant on the Detroit River is the home port for the ore boat. Secure the hawsers quickly. Down comes the clamshell bucket into the laden hole, biting up many tons to the mouthful. The buckets and cranes eat into the cargo. This is the destination of 12,000 tons of rust red earth whose destiny is steel. No rest for the ore bridges, the cranes and the big shovels, for they serve the hungry furnaces for day in and day out for years and years, never cease to devour iron ore. From boat hole to ore pile, from ore pile to transfer car. And thence off to the stockhouse, where it meets the limestone from the quarries of Ohio and coke from the nearby ovens. The push is on. Out comes a rail car full of golden, blazing, hard, porous coke lumps. The glowing car load moves into the quenching house. The fires are drowned in 6,000 gallons of water and a thunderhead of steam balloons skyward. Now journeys end. As the skip hoist dumps successive layers of coke limestone and ore into the top of the blast furnace. As the mixed burden makes its way down through the blazing interior of the furnace, the blast of superheated air is injected through the tweers below the waist of the giant, and the iron ore is reduced to molten iron, which collects in the hearth at the bottom of the furnace. Now it's time to make the cast. The tap hole is opened by burning with a long oxygen lance. The white hot iron comes that's rushing. Really cool, dude. A river of molten iron. No, that's basic awesome, iron, man. From which steel I'd is do made. That. These are the iron men who work the furnace. 
who follow a strange and fascinating calling. The blower watches with understanding eye the golden stream of metal. That'd be so hot. I would, that's the job I would not want. Over 100 tons of iron myself. are poured into each 100%. of the fire brick line thermos cars. Now they're on their way, a two and a half mile journey from the blast furnace division to the main plant down the river. At the end of the line, they enter the plant, bringing a white hot burden of molten pig iron to be stored in an enormous vessel called the hot metal mixer. The thermos cars spill their fiery contents into an 80 ton ladle. The hooks of an enormous crane engage the ladle and begin to lift it. Now it's up to the crane operator who must lift this burden slowly, smoothly, to the mixer 60 feet above the floor. The lid is lifted from the tiny mouth of the giant vessel. As through a needle's eye, he aims the flowing metal straight and sure into the awesome kettle. With deft fingers on the controls, the operator slowly tilts the cauldron into the devil's own reservoir, where 1,500 tons of liquid iron are kept at uniform I think temperature it was the way that they made it. I don't, uh, this I'll look it up. This is the abiding place of but I remember. flame and inferno. The hot mouth of the converter is ready for the waiting Bessemer. Molten pig iron from the nearby mixer moves up on a rail car. Yeah, so it says they called it pig iron because the shape of the molds had many individual ingots and right angles to the central channel. Such configuration looks similar to litter of the ladle and let the metal on a blow. sow. The so that's why they call it pig iron. Never for a moment idle. As the big converter is tilted up again, a mighty blast of air is forced through the metal from below. Far above and safe behind the heavy glass and steel, two operators control the Bessemer with a selection of levers. The regulator has handled the tilting of the vessel. The blower takes over when the conversion process is started. In a matter of minutes, the air forced up through the metal oxidizes a large portion of the undesirable elements and literally blows them skyward. By the color of the flame, the blower knows when the brew is finished. These are the torch lights of steel land, throwing their golden roaring beacons through the roofless rafters. Down again comes the Bessemer, spilling its contents into another enormous ladle. The blown metal is ready to move on to the steel-making open hearth furnaces. But other ingredients are required in the making of steel. In the scrap stockyard adjacent to the open hearth building, Cranes and magnets are busy loading the charging buggy trains. Scrap is precious, since it is mostly steel ready for remelting. And a charging buggy train loaded with scrap, limestone, and other materials rolls into the open hearth building. Each of the great furnaces is operated from the far side of the charging floor. A push of the controls, and the massive doors of the furnace are open. The charging peel pushes and dumps the scrap and limestone into the hot belly of an empty furnace. 
Materials such as silica manganese, ferromanganese, and spigolysin are added in the same manner. The proportion of materials charged into the furnace must be far more exact than the most delicate recipe followed in the kitchen. The operator adjusts the fuel valves. The heat is on. And the flames from one of the great nozzles at either end turns the interior of the furnace into an inferno. First, the massive load of scrap and limestone is melted. Then, ladles of blown metals from the Bessemer converters enter the open hearth building on rail cars. Picked up by the mammoth overhead crane, the enormous vessel is carried down the long charging floor of the open hearth building. And never a drop is spilled. For the operator above and the men giving instructions from the floor level work as smoothly together as a conductor and a symphony orchestra. Here again, it's precision and skill, the cool, clear-headedness, which guarantee the safe handling of 75 tons of liquid metal at over 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The men with the shovels go to work immediately, for the dikes of Cinderlag must be built up around the doors to prevent the seething bath from splashing over. Each man, in his turn, faces the inferno. Like the basting of a roast, it's warm work for the chefs who preside over the cooking of iron into steel. And now, the long vigil. Now comes the sensitive art of steel making. The flames play on the bath of metal for hours as the material is cooked in the great reverberating oven. Delicate instruments register degree of heat, airflow, gas flow, pressure, and other vital information. With eyes protected from the dazzling glare by cobalt blue glasses, the melter watches the heat as a housewife would a Thanksgiving turkey. Steel is a relatively pure form of iron, containing exact and limited amounts of carbon and other elements. In the ordeal by fire, most of the impurities react chemically, becoming stable compounds and are made captive by the slag. Now it's time to reverse the air blast. Alternate the checker valves. Now adjust the fuel flow. All is well, and the running data are recorded on the heat log. Time to take a sample. The exacting specifications of quality steel demand that the chemical composition of the white hot mixture be repeatedly checked by the laboratory. Better drop your glasses. The glare is awesome as the small levers open the doors of the furnace. Take another look. Let's see how she's cooking. Let us look straight into the mouth of this oven. That steel in a rolling boil, spouting and splashing with fury. The hours go by, and the flame roars on. Then the moment comes. Stand by for the ramp. They're cutting in with oxygen at the far side of the furnace. Ram it. Ram it. Cut it deeper. Finally, it breaks through. The hearth has been tapped and steel, at nearly 3,000 degrees, floods out into another great ladle on the pouring aisle. Over 200 tons gush out into this massive vessel. The lighter slag rises to the top and runs off into the slag pot. Now work for another of the steel plant's giants, the crane, which smoothly carries the pride of the open hearth to the ingot mold line without swaying or tilting. 
As the stopper rods are lifted, the molds are filled in pairs. Samples are caught and sent to the laboratory. Here in the teeming pit, the ladle of steel will be poured into huge cast iron molds. These men are like salamanders. They can really take the heat. The ladle empties its contents, and the ingots move along the rails to the stripper building. The great claws and steel finger of the stripper crane separate the molds from the ingot, solidified on the outside, but still molten within. Since the ingots do not cool uniformly, they must be heated to bring them to an even temperature for rolling. From the cooling yard, the ingots are transferred to the soaking pits. Soaked in an atmosphere of 2,400 degrees, soaked for several hours to equalize their temperature. Each pit has its individual fuel and air supply. The wheel adjusts the airflow. And the lever on the fuel pipes controls the fires in the pits. Heat number and classifications are recorded by the tallyman in a continuous running operation. And there's the signal for another ingot. The operators on the control balcony slowly draw back the cover of the pit. It is opened and closed electrically by remote control. One of the powerful cranes which serve the great bank of 60 soaking pits is ready to remove the ingot. The tongues grasp the ingot firmly and lift it from the pit. And away it goes to be rolled in the mills into sizes and shapes of useful steel. The 12 ton glowing mass rolls down the conveyor to the blooming mill. And the men in the control pulpit, safe behind shatterproof glass, are waiting and ready for its coming. Watch how the great yellow-white ingot is pushed about and slapped around by the jaws and rollers of the bloomer. The purpose of this massive machine is to roughly reduce the big heat-softened ingot to a size and thickness suitable for milling. Watch the nimble hands of the operator. In about three minutes, with approximately 20 passes between the driven rolls, the ingot is reduced to a slab less than five inches thick and 45 feet long. Now the enormously powerful shear crops off the end. The heavy slab is cut into lengths of from 5 to 16 feet. The steel mill represents the ultimate in the brilliant engineering of heavy handling systems. The big hot slabs are conveyed to the slab cooling yard by a process which is completely mechanized and almost entirely automatic. The slabs are carefully labeled waiting for repair. Like a 4th of July celebration, the brilliant cascades of showering sparks characterize the scarfing process. Every surface defect is burned off the big steel slabs with an oxygen torch. This ensures that the finished rolled steel strip will be free from imperfections. After the fiery scrubbing, the great steel slabs must be heated again to the rolling temperature. Then out of the slab heating furnace, and down the skids, the red-hot steel starts its jolting, crashing journey along the 2,000-foot steel mill. The first savage shock is at the scale breaker, 
where the water, under 1,000 pounds of pressure, washes the glowing steel clean. Then on through the spreading mill, the big squeeze is on. Now it's headed for the three mammoth universal roughing mills. A mill of this capacity is a thing of tremendous size. Consider the massiveness of these mill stands. The two smaller working mills are backed up by two 65-ton friction-driven rolls, which really apply the pressure. By this time, the steel slab has been rolled out thin, and it slides along the roller table towards the first of six finishing mills. Let's follow the hot steel through one of the world's largest and fastest continuous strip mills. The stands are so close that the strip is passing through all six at one time. The hot steel runs the gauntlet under the personal attention of the men in the balcony who push the buttons and press the levers, keeping the situation strictly under control. The speed at which the rolls turn must be synchronized to split hair accuracy with the increasing speed of the moving sheet as it becomes thinner and longer. Watch the temperature of that moving metal. It must stay hot enough to roll. That's an optical pyrometer in the observer's hand. In the motor room is the power that runs the machine. Enough power to light the homes of a city of a million people. 6,500 motors, ranging in size from one-fourth to 8,700 horsepower, are used to drive the various mills in this plant. At the far end, the finished strip races through the rotary flying shear. Near the end of the hot rolling process, the strip of steel over 90 inches wide and hundreds of feet long has reached a speed of almost 25 miles an hour. And the rippling sheets race along the rollers of the delivery table. Steel that is not to be cut into sheets moves from the final finishing stand in a long continuous ribbon to the hot strip coilers. Compactly coiled, it may become sleek automobile bodies or go into stoves or refrigerators. Upended onto the loading conveyor and marked for identification, the tremendously heavy coil of steel is ready for the pickling department. Stitched together, the strips of steel move in an unending band through the long pickling vats. Then, emerging from the picklers, the strips are cut, recoiled, and conveyed for further processing. Here again, we are impressed by the effortless power of the amazing handling machinery which does the work of lifting and toting in a modern steel mill. The big coils are being moved to another set of mills for cold reduction. Like a huge roll of newsprint, the steel is inserted between the rolls of the first of three big cold reduction mills. So much heat is generated in the rolling process that the cooling spray of water is instantly turned to steam. With small levers, the expert operators compel these massive machines to do their bidding. Despite the enormous size of the machines used, Cold steel rolling is a precision process. Fingertip controls adjust the massive mills which are capable of reducing cold steel to less than half of its original thickness. The gauge of the metal is measured with an electric micrometer, continuously and accurately checking the thickness of the cold reduced steel. The steel emerges from the cold reducing mill to be wound evenly in shining coils. From the original five to seven foot slab may be obtained a strip one twenty-eighth of an inch in thickness and one quarter of a mile in length. 
cold, reduced steel must be annealed to ensure the necessary ductility and mechanical properties which makes steel strip such an infinitely versatile and useful material. Lifted as though it were a feather, the heavy roll of steel is conveyed to the annealing department. After the coils are stacked on the annealing bottom, an air-excluding cover is placed over them. A protective gas is introduced under the cover to prevent oxidation. The portable furnace is as big as a small house. After softening in the annealing furnace, the steel strip will be retempered in the skin pass mill. Then it is ready to go forth into the community as steel of premium quality. Let's circle back now to follow another of the vast plant's many steel milling operations. Here, a red-hot steel billet rolls through nine continuous bar mill stands where it is reduced in cross-section and run out to a length of 100 feet or more. The bars then pass through eight or more stands of the merchant mills, emerging as a thin, narrow, continuous strip of hot rolled steel. Again, the steel strip is neatly coiled. Then the ingenious conveying mechanisms take over. Down the roller table they move to the inspection stands, and without a pause, they're on their way. For steel is utilized just as rapidly as it can be prepared. In the remarkable plant of the Strand Steel Division, coils of steel are consumed in huge quantities. Steel strips racing through the cold forming mills are fashioned into strand steel framing, which go into the making of the famous Quonset buildings. Newly formed webs and angles are paired in the great gang welder to be fused into arch ribs. Other strips of steel are formed into studs and purlins, and the mass production system feeds the vast shipping area from which packaged prefabricated quonsets are shipped by rail to every corner of the nation. Where steel from the Great Lakes plant, newly formed into quonset members, is erected into shelters, the utility of which is unlimited. Thus we've seen, in the big plant on the Detroit River, high-grade steel rolled into a great variety of useful forms. Beneath the vast lofts, different types of mills roll steel in many shapes. Here in another bloomer, an octagonal ingot is prepared for the merchant mills. And at the far end of the process, the final product rolled from the single ingot becomes a thin, hot rod more than a mile and a quarter in length. With rhythmic skill, the sure-handed stranders whip the white-hot ribbon around and back and in and out through the mill stands. This is a spectacle to be seen nowhere but in a big steel rolling plant. Brooding in its vastness and its power, from lesser, commoner efforts set apart. For where it balks against sky, and great stacks tower, the mill embraces a fierce, unusual art. The stuff of dreams and vision bold, the compelling chemistry of the blast, the awesome spectacle, then behold, 
the fulfillment and the triumph of the cast. Rust of the earth, a reddish dirt garnered by giant clay. But men and mills must give it form, ere steel can be its name. Yes, ladies, when choosing your pickle, make sure you're choosing the right one. Always. Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff came in because of the war or after the war. Um, that was incredibly helpful. Uh, so you're not a big fan of being erect? Just saying. That was one of the more common used, more common used ones. So, um, and your other comment, you know, hot environment workers like chairman glass blowers were allowed to drink beer on the job. Uh, you and suppose person, you would not deny a hardworking man a refreshment, would you? That is insane. <laughs> in today's in today's day and age, that's completely crazy. I mean, it's a little bit more acceptable because they are Germans. Um, so I feel like they get at least somewhat of a pass. Uh, but just in general, it, it, it would not be, I would not want to be drinking alcohol around that kind of hot, uh, molten material that would terrify me actually. Um, because I'm, I wouldn't say clumsy or accident prone. I would just say that sometimes I make mistakes. And I would probably die very quickly. So, um, <laughs> so there's always that. But it was just a natural progression. It was okay. So we're building these cars here. Uh, these cars take steel. Why don't we're getting the 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 uh, iron ore from the ground? It's coming, you know, straight straight by us. Um, there was also some. Like I said, they they made a lot of pig iron and that kind of thing here in uh, Detroit in earlier days, as we've covered in previous episodes. And and it just made sense. Why not? If you're going to make everything else here, why not just make the steel here, too? Um, and steel production has drastically went down, just as pretty much all of our manufacturing and industry production has went down, um, which is unfortunate. but. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was, when I say that it was one of the greatest cities in the world, I, I truly mean it. We had everything here. There was, there was no shortage of jobs. There was space. We had water. We had, um, we had areas to escape to, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was, it's, it's a great place to be. It truly, truly is. Um, I wish People would take a little bit more pride in it and take better care of things, but um, I think that's more of a sign of the current time than it is really uh, my city specifically. But but yeah, I mean, we had the big three. We had uh, General Motors Ford and uh, spin the wheel as to what it's called this week <laughs> for the third one, but we had we had huge industry here. We were building stoves. We were building, we were building all these things. And it just made sense to produce the steel here. And it was high quality American steel. And I think with the advent of the cheap Chinese steel coming in from overseas, mixed with the fact that automobiles don't use steel anymore. I mean, most of them are aluminum, uh, plastic. So, and plastic, they can injection mold and, and do at the factory. So, uh, I think if there's still a need for it, we probably would still produce it, but there's just not anymore. Um, which is unfortunate to get lost in in history because of something that you specifically can't control. Uh, but but we had it. We had it all. It was all here, and it was all rolling at the time. Um, 
so I went back and forth on how to do this, and given the time and kind of where we're at, uh, I'm going to preview this section, and then we will get into it in further detail. Um, I'm going to dedicate the, the entire show to the Arsenal of Democracy, which was the seat of Detroit and, and Michigan. Um, this was obviously during the World War II in the early 40s, but encompassed most of the 40s and led to some of the trials and tribulations and, and things that went right, and things that went wrong. Um, so next week's show will be all about the Arsenal of Democracy, which is what uh, President Truman, fireside chat guy, um, what he called Detroit. Detroit became the manufacturing hub for everything in support of GIs and the war effort in Europe and Asia. All the major manufacturers switched gears to wartime production. And we did it all here. Um, we did it all. I don't want to I don't want to jump too far ahead with next week's show, but um, yeah, it was a, a huge time for Detroit and a huge time for, for Michigan in general. And obviously a huge time for the United States and the world. So uh, Detroit was a big, big help in the war effort. And, and we produced and made and did a lot uh, to further the Allied victory. So that's what's coming up for next week. And then I figured I'd waste a couple minutes. So, like I said, I went downtown uh, this weekend. Um, this was at Dosen, which is the uh, it's the boating museum on Belle Isle, part of the Detroit Historical Society and part of that whole um, general uh, conglomeration of things, I guess you would call it. Um, so I thought this. The sign was funny, and so me, <laughs> to Pablo, six boats every day. Take one, take anyone for a cool cruise to Gay Pablo, Detroit's Pleasure Island, Dockfoot of Woodward, Dance Band Always Aboard. So it was like a, it was a pleasure cruise to, I actually don't know where the hell Pablo is, but it's, it's really gay. So, and I think this is gay in the happy scent because this is, this is way back, um, way back. And it could be just taking it to Belle Isle. That could have been, maybe Bobo was Belle Isle. I don't know. I have to look that up because now I've confused myself slightly. Um, so this is, this is Bobo. And again, it's really small, but. So there's a, supposed to be a roller coaster, some boats. It was, and I believe this is Belle Isle. I think it's Belle Isle, but I'm not 100%, so I'll look it up. Uh, here's a bell from one of the ships, one of the early ships that were in uh, the waterways around Michigan. You see it says City of Detroit 3 from 1912. So. Really old bell. Uh, this I thought was pretty. It's the the Sal discovering the region. And it's on stained glass. It, so if you ever go to the Dosa Museum on Bell Isle, it's in the in the main atrium kind of area, and it's some very old stained glass, and it's really pretty. And it depicts uh, it depicts that kind of thing where it, it shows you the uh, I've literally worked for Solid Steel Erections LLC, <laughs> pulling the world together. <laughs> uh, American infrastructure still exists, but not like before. Yeah, no, it's it's significantly reduced from what it from what it once was. Um, and it's unfortunate because we still have plenty of workers in the area and everything we would need to be ridiculously successful we just uh just unfortunately abandon it for the most part so um and this is the anchor from the edmund fitzgerald which is a boat that sank 
and we'll get into that at a later date. That sank in 1975, so we're not quite there yet. Um, I also went down to this is from a previous episode, and the first time I could make it down there, um, because of weather and other factors, but you know, things happen. Um, this is St. Anne's Church, so we've talked about it, uh, we've looked into it, and we've explored it before. Um, so this is one of the ones that the original, the original race relations we've heard about various things surrounding this church. Um, gorgeous church, really bad area of town, really bad area of town. Um, but I did stop by and take some pictures. Um, so this is the bottom. As you can see, it's it's starting to show its age, but it's also what, 250 years old? 300 years old, something like that. So this is Gabriel Richard, the plaque for Gabriel Richard, and St. Anne, 1886. So 250 years. So not not bad. Uh, here's a view looking up. It was not open. I tried to go in um, so I could talk to somebody or maybe take some photos. Um, it was not open. This is the the house right next to it. And it's just really pretty, that French Gothic. So, so that is the church. Like I said, not a great area of town, but a very pretty, very pretty. So, but... So like I said, we're going to end a little bit early today because I want to give a full show to the uh, wartime and industrial production in the city of Detroit. So that is going to be it for me tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, catch me tomorrow for news and views, news roundup, that kind of thing. And, oh, it, it's so amazing. Um, but until then, I'm going to go get some sleep. So, hope everyone has a good night. Thanks for stopping by and watching. As always, please hit that like button on your way out. And until next time, have a good night, everybody. Detroit, Michigan. Oh, yeah. Detroit, Michigan. Yeah.